So we're ready to go? Yes, we are. Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar. Hi, my name is Kevin Wong, and I am the director of the Desert Institute at Joshua Tree National Park, which is the educational program for the Joshua Tree National Park Association. With me is Lara Roselle of the National Park Service, who originally proposed a series of webinars to train park staff on park-specific topics while they are working remotely during this pandemic. We will be your hosts and the producers of, this, of these webinars. Before we get started, I would like to offer some tips on how to use this webinar effectively. As internet bandwidth is being heavily used in California due to the stay-at-home direction, and so many of us are working remotely, we may have issues with internet connections. If you're using audio through your computer, and if the audio poses problems during this presentation, you may want to turn to the call in option. The phone number and access code for the presentation is found on the registration confirmation page that you all received. In addition, when the webinar begins, you will see a small control panel on your screen, generally in the upper right corner. If you click on the red arrow, the control panel will expand. At the bottom of the control panel, there is a question feature where you can ask questions that we will present to the speaker during the presentation. We will also unmute the audience during the presentation so that you can ask questions. Please try not to ask all of your questions at the same time. At this time, we will begin. Today's presentation is Birds of Joshua Tree National Park with Kurt Leuschner. Kurt, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, hi, everybody. I hope there's somebody out there. It's kind of weird not being able to see you, uh, but you will get a chance to ask questions. So jot down those questions and um, definitely at the end, we'll have time to answer them and maybe even a few points during the presentation. Um, I think there's a chat feature. You might be able to type in a question as we go along. Yeah, Kurt, this is uh, just to clarify. Yes, people can type in comments and questions at any time and um, and I will pass them on at convenient times. Great. Um, so we're going to talk birds today and we're breaking up this presentation into two parts this week and next week because uh, I wasn't sure if we could fit it all in in 45 minutes and we've already eaten up seven minutes. So um, I'm glad we broke it into two parts. I think that'll work out better. Uh, one thing to note um, is my email address. You might want to jot that down at some point or now. Um, it's kloichner at collegeofthedesert.edu. Uh, so if you have uh, follow-up questions um, in the future or want to send me photos of birds or bugs or wildflowers, or reptiles or any of that kind of stuff, I'm happy to um, identify those things for you and tell you more about them. So that's just something to keep for the future uh, reference, uh, my email address. Um, I live here in Palm Desert, and um, I think you're all really lucky to work in Joshua Tree National Park. I'm kind of envious. Uh, one of the reasons I moved out here to Palm Desert 25 years ago was to be close to Joshua Tree and also the Salton Sea, two of my favorite places for birds. Um, and it's just beautiful scenery. Um, I started visiting Joshua Tree in 1980 uh, doing rock climbing uh, as an explorer scout. So I've been coming out here ever since and um, teaching these classes since about the year 2000. So this is 20 years, I guess. So um, anyway, um, let's get to the birds and talk bird migration. Um, we're right in the midst of spring migration, so it's a good time to be talking about birds migrating through the park. Um, hopefully you're seeing my screen and you can see some white dots in the blue sky with black tips. Um, if you were talking to me, I'd ask you if you knew what those birds were, but uh, maybe you recognize them as white pelicans and they do fly over the park. Uh, both in the spring and the fall. So every now and then you'll look up and you might see a, a scene like this one right over Joshua Tree National Park. Um, unfortunately, the Salton Sea um, is losing and may have lost its fish, the tilapia, and that's a whole other topic 
I could give in the future, the salt and sea. But um, the white pelican numbers are way down now, uh, sadly, because there's no fish in the sea for them. I'm writing you down for the salt and sea topic. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, anyway, um, back to migration. So uh, a true migration means, you know, going somewhere and coming back to the starting point. Um, the return trip is the key to migration. If you're just going one way, that's more of an emigration, technically. And um, with birds, we often use the term dispersal as well, which is more of a one-way um, trip uh, in more of a random fashion, dispersal, not a migration. Um, these are some migrations you've probably heard of, the, the wildebeest in the Serengeti. Uh, that go across um, the Mara River every year to new feeding grounds and back um, closer to home. We've got caribou migrations in the Arctic, summer ranges and winter ranges. Uh, that's a true migration. Uh, monarch butterflies um, is, is a migration of sorts. Um, the monarchs travel from Mexico to Canada and then the generation that's born in Canada at the end of summer travels all the way back down to Mexico. Um, and this is a migration, but it's not the same individual butterfly that's doing it each time. It's kind of a, a tag team effort uh, involving about four generations of monarchs to complete that migration. The ones here on the Pacific coast and the ones that fly through Joshua Tree, by the way, the monarchs aren't part of that epic migration that goes all the way down to central Mexico. Um, ours do a shorter version of that story. And that's another topic I could probably speak an hour or so on um, insects and um, migrating monarchs. Writing that down? Yeah, write that one down too. Um, sea turtles um, do some amazing migrations underwater and are able to find their way back to the exact same beach they were born on seven years later. These are some roots here you can see uh, from sea turtles that have been tracked. Salmon migrations you've heard about. Bats uh, migrate. Um, and that's another great topic uh, for the future is bats. We've got about 18 species in Joshua Tree National Park alone. And all of our bats um, here are insect eating bats. And individual bats can eat thousands of, of mosquitoes and small insects in one night. So they're just really great to have around um, and something we could talk more about in the future. But they migrate. So they most of our bats go down to Mexico or even further south, uh, but most probably go to Mexico to winter and then come back um, about this time of year. A few of them hang around and do hibernate locally, uh, but most of them migrate away and come back. This is kind of a fun one. If you ever get to Christmas Island, you can see the crabs migrating from one side of the island to the other. They close the roads at certain times of the year for this. And uh, one of the longest migrations ever, and the longest for a mammal, is the humpback whale, 6,000 miles plus each way. And painted ladies, now, these are uh, butterflies that are flying through the park and probably through your yard as we speak. Uh, these past few weeks, we've seen um, thousands and thousands of painted ladies moving through. Some years there's more, some years there's less. This year, is, you know, it's a pretty good year. I've seen a lot of them moving through. It's not technically a migration because they're not really coming back. It's more of an emigration um, or more of a dispersal. Uh, most of the painted ladies flying through the Coachella Valley and through Joshua Tree National Park were born in Mexico and are just dispersing northward as it warms up and as the flowers um, start to um, pop. Uh, they lay their eggs on various plants. One of the reasons um, painted ladies are so abundant, more abundant than other butterflies, is because they're generalists. They, they can lay their eggs on a variety of host plants. So if one's not available, they can use a substitute. This is an interesting moth that I've seen in Joshua Tree at the lights at Black Rock, for example. It's called a black witch. Uh, so something to watch for. I see about one of these a year. 
And these moths are also born in Mexico. They fly over the border wall and fly into places like Joshua Tree National Park. And sometimes they fly as far north as the Canadian border. So it's just something to watch for. It looks like a big bat uh, perched on the side of your house, maybe near your porch light, it's called a black witch. Again, it's not really a migration in this case, it's more of a one-way trip, a dispersal heading north. Kurt, I'm gonna pop in with a few audience questions and remarks. Um, yeah. So first of yeah. all, we have a question from Stephanie. Um, can you talk about car fatalities for the painted ladies and migrating butterflies? Because of course, when we drive our cars, sometimes it's it seems to add up. Yeah, it. what can I say? I mean, um, it's not like we can break for every painted lady, but um, they do get hit and, um, you know, it's just part of the deal, I guess. I don't know much more that I can say about that, but uh, yeah, just I another- Yeah, I don't know of any research on the populations, but maybe it exists out there. Well, another reason to, to adhere to the speed limits, especially in the park, right? You know, we don't want to- run over too many tarantulas and hit too many painted ladies and we've got to watch out for tortoises etc right so yes um, now at certain times of the year the caterpillars of the painted ladies will be on the roads as well as the caterpillars of the sphinx moths and that's another issue you know how do you dodge those things and it's it's tough when you've got hundreds of those things crossing the road at once i think mostly getting out of your car and moving them across the road in the direction of travel is what i recommend but that is not a widely adopted recommendation um <laughs> we also have a long note from Kristen, who is yeah. the joshua Tree wildlife biologist and yeah. she says we have 16 confirmed species of bats and um, of course she has also listed them all here and so yeah. i might let you guys compare lists later well, I'm not going to argue over 16 or 18 in this case. <laughs> you know, there's definitely 18 in the area. Maybe there's a couple that haven't been recorded in Joshua Tree yet that are nearby. So, um, yeah, 16 is is a good number for the park, and 18 okay. maybe for the, for the whole surrounding area. Note, we have a note from Dave Larson that yes, indeed, uh, someone at the Oasis Visitor Center did report seeing a bat that turned out to be a moth from the last slide. Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah, and there's another bird coming up in the show that's often mistaken for a bat, so we'll get to that in a minute. Any other questions for now? That's it for now. Okay, so um, tarantulas um, are in the park, as you know, and, and I always tell people if they want to see tarantulas in the wild that Joshua Tree is one of the best places to go, especially in October and November. Um, that's when the males tend to come out and cruise around and, and do get hit on the roads during that time, unfortunately but they're looking for the females who are usually hiding um, in their burrows. The females, because they're not uh, wandering around as much or at all, um, can live over 20 years in those burrows, whereas the male's lifespan is much shorter, just a year or two. So again, they're not really migrating, they're just moving around, uh, in this case, dispersing and moving around looking for females. Um, dragonflies, don't really migrate, but they can wander a long way from water sources. So they're born in the water, but um, can wander, you know, 10 kilometers or more from water, six miles. So you'll see them throughout the park, even um, in places where there isn't any water nearby. And uh, they're good to have around. They eat a lot of mosquitoes as well. But again, they're not really migrating, just moving around. Now, finally, uh, getting to birds, which is today's topic, uh, the world champion migrant bird has got to be the Arctic tern, which essentially is going from pole to pole and back, uh, which is about 44,000 miles round trip. So that's um, a world record migration right there. So when we're looking at migrant birds, uh, maybe you've seen charts like this one before uh, with a major North American flyways, there's four of them. Now the birds don't always consult these charts, they just go at their instincts. But if you track where birds um, tend to um, mass up during migration, they're usually along these four pathways. And you can see that uh, where Joshua Tree lies along the Pacific flyway, the whole Western United States. But look, um, look at the top of these, um, pathways and you'll notice how they bend quite a bit to the west 
And so for instance, you can see a bird that might be in the green pathway, the Mississippi flyway, which bends all the way over to Alaska. Um, a bird that's born at, in Alaska along that green pathway could just as easily drop down and migrate through the Pacific flyway, the yellow path, instead of bending east to, to uh, follow that green path. So if they didn't get the memo that they're supposed to stay on the green path, you can see that some of these birds in the green and the pink, and of course the yellow path can just drop straight down and occur in places like Joshua Tree National Park. And that's why um, the fall birding, as opposed to spring bird watching, um, can be even more exciting in a place like Joshua Tree because you never know what uh, first year birds are gonna kind of drop down and take a wrong turn and show up in the park. So that's when we get weird birds from the blue or the green or the pink flyways showing up um, here in the desert during the fall. Now, uh, migration timing, uh, migration starts pretty early uh, for some birds. So here we are in um, almost mid-April now, but way back in January, we had our first vultures and swallows coming through. They're usually the first to start showing up, even in January, and then come the shorebirds. Some shorebirds start moving north pretty early. Um, other species, and the willow flycatcher is kind of exceptional, don't migrate until late June. So it's kind of interesting that um, while willow flycatchers are heading north, uh, the first shorebirds that have already migrated and nested and raised their young are already heading south. So they'll actually cross each other uh, during the month of June, especially in late June. So it's kind of important to you know, if you want to learn these birds and what's supposed to be in the park to learn about the timing of their migrations and when they should be there. Um, the field guides don't always cover that in great detail. So sometimes you have to do a little digging for that uh, specific information. Or again, you can always email me and I can um, help you out with that too and tell you whether or not a bird like should be in the park or not at a certain time of the year. These are some flycatchers that um, pass through the park. Um, on the left is the endangered one, the southwestern willow flycatcher. It doesn't nest in the park that we know of, at least not currently. Uh, maybe in the past it might have, but it does pass through the park um, during spring and also in the fall, southwestern willow flycatcher. The western wood peewee in the center is actually one of our most common uh, migrants, uh, flycatcher migrants, and um, you can expect to start seeing those in, in a week or two, maybe the first ones might start showing up. They're kind of a medium-sized, pretty slim flycatcher. And then the olive sided flycatcher on the right um, is also a spring and a fall migrant passing through the park, heading up to um, the coniferous forest where it's going to breed. So, so um, the olive sided flycatcher actually prefers freshly burned areas. So one of the benefits of wildfires um, happens to be that it does provide habitat for certain species like the olive sided flycatcher, which actually prefer freshly burned areas. So that's one place to watch for them. Some different types of migration. Um, complete migration is when all members of the species migrate. If some members of the species migrate and others do not, then we say that they're partial migrants. Um, if species are just kind of moving up and down the slopes, um, then we might classify them as an altitudinal migrant. And this can depend on the weather and food availability. Um, Joshua Tree is one of those places where during um, a, a cold winter or a period uh, where there's a bad winter storm, you could get interesting birds coming down from Big Bear and from the San Bernardino Mountains, for example, and they could spend time in the park and then they can retreat back up to the mountains when things get warmer, altitudinal migrants. Um, and then there's sort of this grab bag category of eruptive or irregular migrants that uh, these are birds that move around sporadically in unpredictable fashion, but it's usually um, 
because of food that they're moving around. Now, um, more birds than you think uh, migrate at night. Um, so if um, most of the small birds, uh, for example, migrate at night and use the stars and magnetic fields for, uh, to guide them, some species migrate only during the day, and so we call them daytime migrants. And then there's the in-between time. So there's there's some species, and we'll go through um, some examples uh, of crepuscular migrants. These are birds that migrate in the evening hours and also in the early morning, but not necessarily all throughout the night and not necessarily in the middle of the day, sort of in the in-between times, crepuscular. So in general, though, most birds are night migrants. Now here's a bird, uh, Voxus swift, which is a complete migrant. So that means all Voxus swifts migrate. And they're also crepuscular. So when we see these swifts um, passing through the park, it's usually in spring, um, sometimes in fall, but spring uh, more likely. And um, they'll be passing through either in the late afternoon from about say four to 6 p.m or you might catch a few um, flying in the early morning uh, from you know, 6 to say 8.30 in the morning. And these birds actually look a lot like bats and they're easily mistaken for bats from, from somebody who doesn't you know, spend a lot of time looking at bats or birds. Um, you could easily pass this off as a bat when you see it fly by. They also roost in chimneys. And um, one of the good reasons to um, cap your chimney is to prevent these swifts actually from coming into your house because um, that is a concern here where I live. We have a lot of snowbirds, a lot of people who, who aren't here during the winter or aren't here during the summer, I should say. And um, these foxes swifts will roost in their chimneys and go into their homes while the people aren't home and then they can't get back out, so they get trapped. And um, people will come back to their homes after being away for weeks or months and they'll find a bunch of dead swifts in their living room and they'll usually report them as bats. So when you hear people reporting a bunch of dead bats in their house, it's almost always Vox's swifts that they're actually reporting because they don't realize it's actually a bird. So cap those chimneys. Um, Bullock's Orioles are moving through right now. I've got one in my backyard as we speak. And uh, these are night migrants, and, and so are summer tanagers, for example. Um, so the Orioles are already starting to arrive, uh, and the tanagers will be arriving uh, in a couple of weeks. Night migrants. Bluebirds, uh, western bluebirds are complete migrants, and sometimes they respond to cold temperature and become sort of an altitudinal migrant. Mountain bluebirds um, migrate, but they're very irregular. So you could go 10 years or more between seeing a mountain bluebird in Joshua Tree National Park. So um, I remember a few years ago, it was probably eight or nine years ago now, but we did have one of those years when mountain bluebirds were seen uh, quite um, frequently in Joshua Tree National Park, but it's been a while. The same thing can happen down at the Salton Sea. Some years we see no blue mountain bluebirds at all. Other years we see hundreds of them down there. So something to watch for, but your, your typical bluebird you're going to see is a western bluebird. Joshua Tree is probably the most reliable place in the whole region uh, to see pinion jays. So when um, bird watchers ask me where to see a pinion jay, I almost always uh, send them to Black Rock when it's open. And um, if they stand around there long enough, usually a pinion jay will fly by or you'll hear one in the distance at least. They have kind of a laughing call. Um, but it's a very reliable place to see them. And they do nest in the area there at Black Rock because they're pinion pine trees. Otherwise, they can be hard to find uh, because they move around a lot depending on food availability. Ruby crowned kinglets are, are complete migrants, so they all migrate, and a number of them winter in the southwest, including Joshua Tree. 
So something to always watch for during the winter, even in your own backyard, the ruby crown kinglet. Uh, don't expect to see the ruby crown. Most of the time it's hidden. Unless the uh, male gets mad, then he'll kind of flare up his crown, as you can see in the photo. It's a very common winter resident of the area. Kurt, I think I learned this one during the Joshua Tree Christmas bird count this year. Do you recognize a ruby crown, crowned kinglet by its quick little hopping around motions in the bushes also? Um, it does have a habit of flicking its wings. It's kind of like a nervous little twitch that it has. So if you stare at it for just a few seconds, it will surely kind of flick its wings and tail for you. And that helps you ID it as a ruby crown kinglet as well. Okay. Any other questions come in since we last checked? We don't have any other questions at present. Folks should okay. feel free to ask questions. All right. Um, cedar waxwings are winter residents of the area and of the park. Um, and a group of waxwings is called a museum. Now there's a, um, a waxwing called a bohemian waxwing. And um, you can tell them from a cedar waxwing by looking at the vent of the waxwing. And if you see one with a cinnamon colored vent, that's the area underneath the tail, that would be a bohemian waxwing. So anytime you see one of these uh, museums or flocks of waxwings in a tree, scan their vents and look for one with a cinnamon vent. And after doing that for about 10 years, then you'll probably come up with a bohemian uh, waxwing. It happens every now and then in the desert. And can you help us with what part of the bird is the vent? Well, it's that, it's that area um, under the tail just above the tail, um, kind of where their feet poke out, just beneath where the feet are, the vent. Okay. okay. Where they relieve themselves. Got it. But you've got to have a, a kind of a, a front on view of them to, to see the vent, just like the picture there in the lower left. And so if you saw one there that had cinnamon color, right where the, the, the feet meet the branch, that would be a bohemian waxwing. Something to watch for. Um, Western tanagers will be arriving soon and migrating through the park, uh, not nesting in the park, but moving through. Uh, they nest up in the mountains, uh, top of the tramway, um, Big Bear, High Sierra, <clears throat> but they're pretty common migrants. They don't eat seed, uh, so they're not going to be attracted to bird feeders in your yard, but they do, um, they are attracted to water. Um, and so dripping water, like in um, behind Black Rock Campground, there's some water dripping back there sometimes, a little spring area. That can be a good place to see these Western tanagers. They were originally um, described, or at least uh, collected by Lewis and Clark, and that's why they have the name Ludovisiana, to refer to the Louisiana Purchase. The Orioles are arriving. The Hooded Oriole on the lower right is associated with palm trees. I've got them in my yard here in Palm Desert right now. Um, they're nectar feeders. They'll also eat insects. And the Scots Oriole, which is really one of the uh, sort of quintessential birds of Joshua Tree, um, is associated with yuccas, uh, including the Joshua Tree. And so that's one of the special birds of the park for sure, the Scots Oriole with the black head and the yellow body. They nest in the Joshua trees. They're complete migrants, so all these Orioles are gonna disappear in the fall and head south of the border. But they're all returning um, now and, and should have already arrived, at least the first ones. There's uh, some birds that actually spend the summer in the desert. And these are three of those birds that, that come up here uh, just for the summer uh, and then head south again. Um, the ash-shouted flycatcher on the left is just arriving. Every now and then we get a few of them that winter here in the desert that don't go south of the border, but most of them do. Um, ash-shouted flycatchers like those mid elevations in the park um, and like the pinyon pine area and the juniper area so you might look for them in places like black rock for example um, or up towards keys view 
the western kingbird in the middle um, should be arriving soon and some of them have already arrived and they'll spend the summer with us so they're not just migrants they're summer residents and they like the open areas where they can perch on a wire perch um, out in the open to um, catch flies which is what they do uh, the outer tail feathers have a clear white um, edge to them as you can see in the photo and that's one of the keys to telling them apart from the Cassin's kingbird the white winged dove on the right are also uh, summer residents of the area pretty easy to identify with that white patch in the wing and um, they're already starting to arrive and, and more will arrive soon and some of them um, especially in places like Palm Desert are starting to overwinter I don't know if it's happening up in the Joshua Tree area yet, but that could happen up there too with climate changing and getting warmer than it used to be. We had one sitting in a bowl on our porch a couple of weeks ago. Um, okay. it, it did not build up a nest, but it hung out in a bowl for a couple hours and then left. So, you know, I wonder, is that one that spent the winter here and maybe didn't migrate or is that an early arrival? Um, so, you know, you should keep track of sightings like that, and and the more data you have, then then you can start answering those questions. Um, I didn't mention this, and maybe some of you know about it, but one great place to report your sightings is eBird.org. Uh, so at eBird.org, which is run through a Cornell Lab of Ornithology, um, you can um, save all of your sightings, report your sightings share your sightings with the rest of the world it's free it's easy and it's a great way uh, for you and others to contribute to uh, citizen science and you can also go there and, and look for data on certain birds if you're if you're researching them or studying them anyway back to the slide here we've got a brown-headed cowbird now brown-headed cowbirds are daytime migrants and so they fly around during the daytime not at night um, and they are parasites of other birds maybe you've heard about this in the lower right is a cowbird trap and in this region and i'm sure maybe even in joshua tree they've been doing some cowbird trapping over the years and it does seem to be working um, the female cowbird lays her eggs in other birds nests such as the least bells vireo which you see in the lower left it's one of their favorite victims and so these least bells vireos, for example, end up raising a cowbird rather than raising any of their own kind. Um, so cowbird numbers go up and other birds numbers go down. And since they started these uh, cowbird, this cowbird trapping program, um, birds like least bells vireos are starting to make a, a comeback, even in places like Joshua Tree. So no longer are they just a migrant passing through Joshua Tree. Um, some of them are actually attempting to nest. I don't know if they've actually nested within Joshua Tree in recent years. That would be something to check on, but they certainly are nesting in Big Morongo Canyon Preserve, which is just outside the park. Um, and that's good to see that they're making a comeback. The way these cowbird traps work is they tether a cowbird or two in the trap to, to serve as bait and their cowbird buddies will come to check them out. They'll land on the trap and they'll drop down through a, a thin um, opening in the middle of the trap um, to join their friends and eat the seed and drink the water that's in the trap. And then they can't get out again. So it's a one way kind of a trap. And then each morning um, the researchers will come and open up the trap and uh, let go any birds that fell in there by mistake and then humanely dispatch the cowbirds as needed to keep their numbers in check. We could talk a lot more about cowbirds, but it's time to move on. Um, burrowing owls historically were in Joshua Tree National Park and still probably occur um, along the border with the town of Joshua Tree. Uh, maybe some of you um, can confirm that with sightings, but they used to be more common. Now they're not nearly as common and have been extirpated from a lot of places where they used to occur. Um, some of our burrowing owls are year-round residents. 
while others are migrants. It's kind of um, weird to think of a burrowing owl migrating, but they do. So the ones that, that summer up in Canada, for example, and in the northern US, when it starts to get really cold up there in the fall, they migrate south and will spend the winter with their southern cousins. So at the Salton Sea, for example, we see a lot of these burrowing owls. And in the winter, it's a mix of the resident ones and the migrant ones. You can't really tell them apart. It's very rare to see a burrowing owl in migration, but it has happened. Um, I've seen it one time. Um, I saw a burrowing owl in a place where it just shouldn't have been, and it was right during migration time. So I think I caught one, you know, right in the middle of migration. So that's something to watch for. So you should definitely document all sightings of burrowing owls um, on eBird or at least in your own notebooks, because that can be very um, useful information. Kurt, can we circle back to Orioles for a moment? Sure. We have a question from Bruce. He has Scots, Hooded, and Bullocks Orioles on his feeders now in Morongo yeah. Valley. Yeah. Are there any other Orioles that he's likely to see? No, those are the three. Those are the three Orioles you expect. Um, now you can. There is. There are. There's one or two records of a streak-backed Oriole in the region. You know, so sometimes you get a real oddity from Mexico showing up. But those are the three. The the Scots again is going to be here all summer nesting in the Joshua trees and in yuccas. The hooded will be associated with palm trees and be with us all summer. The bullocks are mostly migrants moving through, although some of those may nest um, in the high desert. They don't tend to nest down here in the low desert, but they may nest up where you guys are in the high desert, um, especially if there's cottonwood trees around. They really are partial to cottonwoods. And then Dave Larson also remarks that it's been eight years since he saw a mountain bluebird in Joshua Tree, um, way, way, way back in the days when Joe Zarkey was chief of Interp. So I wonder if anybody has a more recent mountain bluebird sighting. Well, I think I didn't I estimate it was about eight years ago when, when they had that last eruption there. So that sounds about right. Um, uh -huh. And so, again, maybe once a decade or so, we get one of these eruptions of them. So, in a, you know, we'll be due soon. Um, but it, it depends on the weather and food. All right. Um, but, and we're not getting any uh, burrowing owl confirmations in Joshua Tree. Yeah, and that's not surprising. Again, they're just really um, declining in throughout almost their entire range. Um, poor wills. Uh, somebody just um, sent me a mystery sound and wanted me to identify it, which I'm happy to do. And it was a poor will. And so poor wills are starting to to call. So that's something to listen for in the evening and at night, um, especially if you live in the foothills. Um, they summer in Joshua Tree National Park, and most of them migrate south of the border during the winter. But a few of them, and it's really not known how many there are, but it can't be that many, but a few of them winter locally. And this was confirmed, although the Native Americans knew about this long before 1946, it was confirmed among um, others in, in 1946. You can see um, Dr. Edmund Yeager reenacting the discovery of the hibernating poor will in December of 1946. There's a little crevice in the rock there. And for two years, two winters in a row, that same bird came back to that crevice and was in a complete hibernation. So normally when birds um, rest at night, um, they go into a state of torpor, which is kind of like a temporary, not so deep hibernation. But this was different. This was uh, considered to be a true hibernation. You know, they took all the body me bodily measurements and uh, it fit all the parameters of a true deep, deep sleep or hibernation. And so it's the only bird really known uh, to hibernate. So it's really interesting. So something to watch for especially if you work in a place like Joshua Tree, uh, when you're traipsing around in the winter amongst the rocks, you know, you could find the next hibernating poor will. There's only been just a handful of them found over the years, including this one um, in Desert Center that you see in the lower right. Um, if any of you are interested, uh, we could do a little field trip sometime to that spot. I took my National Geographic um, from 1948, I think it was, when they featured this story. 
and I walked around the desert out near Desert Center, uh, around where I knew this campsite was, and I was able to match up the photos in the National Geographic with the crevice in the rock that you see below there, and I was able to find that little crevice, so that was kind of neat. Um, it's, it's outside of the park, but not too far outside of Joshua Tree near Desert Center. We anyway, want to really take cool. up on that. And we also have a late breaking confirmation of burrowing owls at Lucky Park, personally observed by Sarah Jane. Oh, wow. Okay. Lucky Park, which, yeah. So that's just outside of the park um, on off of Utah Trail. Um, so I wonder if they're nesting there. So I'd say keep an eye on them and, and, and chart their existence there throughout the different weeks or months so we can confirm whether they're actually nesting there or just moving through or something. Yeah, and Stephanie says she hears owls at Black Rock. Are there other owls that she might be hearing? Um, I think we're gonna get to the owls. Uh, it might be next week, but um, but sure, at Black Rock, you're gonna hear great horned owls. Um, almost any night of the year, you could hear one. It goes, so it's usually about five hoots with little paws in between. Um, and the other owl that you'll hear at Black Rock would be the barn owl, which is more of a screeching sound. Doesn't really sound owl-like at all. Um, so, but great horned owls would be the main one that you're gonna hear um, calling in the park anywhere, but especially Black Rock. Anyway, poor Will. Um, we're uh, about out of time. So let's, we'll, I guess we'll finish off with this kestrel here, but, um, American kestrels are very common in the region, and uh, you'll see them on the, the fringing areas of Joshua Tree National Park. Uh, they're small falcons, and they eat a lot of um, insects, actually, dragonflies and grasshoppers and crickets. Occasionally, they'll eat a small bird, like a sparrow, uh, hence their nickname, the sparrow hawk. And um, uh, they'll eat lizards and things like that as well. They're partial migrants, so we've got resident kestrels that are here all year, and then we have others that come down here for the winter and some that pass through. So it's kind of a mixture. So it is uh, 146, so I think we should wrap this up and maybe open it up to other questions. And then there'll be a lot more birds to talk about next week. So I hope you'll be able to come back same time next week. Thank you so much for agreeing to split this in half, Kurt, so that we could absorb um, you know, the birds that we're yeah. not familiar with. And I'm going to go ahead and unmute everyone. So uh, I'll unmute you through this machine. And then if you want to ask a question, go ahead and unmute your phone as well and uh, give questions or comments. Yeah, and remember to email me too when you have more questions, you know, in the when we're done with the class. There's my email address. Cool. Questions, comments, stories? Anybody? Is anybody out there? <laughs> hey, Kurt. It's Dave Larson. Um, any tips on identifying or differentiating the sharp shinned? Um, from, from the Coopers? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So um, the time of year, of course, is really important. So the Coopers is a year-round resident bird, right? The sharp shin's only here in the winter. And so um, if, if it's out of season, um, then the sharp shins won't be here and you don't have to worry about sharp shins. But if it is during the winter or right now, um, there's still a few sharp shins around, so you do have to be careful. Sharp shins are smaller than Coopers. Um, their tail is shorter and more square-tipped. Although, you know, Cooper's tails can look squared off too, but it's more the length of the tail. And um, I find that sharp shins flap a lot more. They're, they're more like a kestrel sized bird. Whereas Cooper's, you know, are, are, are definitely a degree larger. Um, and so their, their flapping isn't as quick and as deep as a sharp shin. So the way they fly, also the sharp shin takes tighter circles when it's circling around the sky because of its small size. So, um, yeah, maybe that will help a little bit, but practice is the hey, best way. Thank you. Another question. Uh, in, the, in the Big Morongo Preserve, um, yeah. we're seeing occasionally 
hybrid woodpeckers between ladder back and yep. nettle, correct? Yes, you're right. That's that's one of those zones where they overlap because it's kind of where the desert meets the, the riparian habitat. And so nut alls is almost always associated with water and cottonwood trees and riparian habitats. And ladderbacks are associated with the desert, right? So if you're in the true desert, it's ladderbacks. If you're uh, streamside, it's usually nut alls. But Morongo is one of those weird places where you have both. So you have to be careful. And uh, they do hybridize there. So you'll see individuals with characteristics of both. OK, and one last thing. Um, speaking of Lucky Park, yeah. I'm almost certain I've seen both greater and lesser nighthawks in the same area. Now, you mean common nighthawk and lesser nighthawk, I guess? Those yes, excuse me. Yeah. Yes, thank yeah. you. Um, well, lesser is the one you expect based on its range and, and where it should occur. Um, common would be unusual. So you'd want to document that carefully. I, I, I guess I would ask you, why do you think they were common? Did you hear it call? That would be the best way to ID it. Yes. Because they go they go ping, ping, you know, they make that really unique sound. So if you heard it, then there's no doubt it's a common. Okay. Um, if, if you're not hearing it, then um, it's a little trickier. You know, you got to look for the, the uh, positioning of that white oval in the wing. Um, lessers don't really call either. They're more or less silent. So... So yeah, if you heard it, it could be a common. Now common like the coniferous forest, so they're gonna be up in the mountains, but occasionally, you know, one could wander down or maybe be flying through Lucky Park. Maybe it was a migrant. Depends on the time of the year. All right, thank you very much. But document that one closely, yeah, if you see it again. And record it too. You know, you guys can use your iPhones to record uh, sounds and then you can um, download those those sounds on your eBird reports. And um, it's a great way to document species. You don't have to have any fancy equipment. And, and speaking of the ladder back and the note alls woodpecker, I find the best way to ID them is to listen to the call. You know, the, the ladder back will give a single pick note and the note alls almost always gives a little hiccup, like so to yeah. me, hearing them is the best they way. They sound a little different, and of course, the nuttles have more black on the neck. Is kind of something I look for. Right, right, right. Other questions, anyone? Don't be shy. Anyway, um, will you get to phenopeplas next week? Yes, for sure. Okay, I'll save my phenopepla question. Oh yeah. So again, feel free to email me in the meantime. We can keep talking birds all week if you want. I'm here. Well, thank, thank you, Kurt, for being here today. We really appreciate it. And thank you to our audience. We have one more webinar today at 3 p.m. It's Climate Change, Joshua Trees and Optimism with Chris Clark. So I hope you all tune into that one. Until then, please stay safe and stay healthy. Uh, we're going to sign off with this webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so everybody. Much,